today's topic is really going to bring us into the 20th, 21st century. And uh, I want to look at um, the social psychological roots of contemporary partisan polarization, as well as its institutional logic. And, and I'll just refresh your memories ever so briefly. We talked about Frances Lee of Princeton, her work in contemporary political science, showing that when there is partisan parity, when in particular either party could win control of Congress in the next election, the incentives for polarization increase, the incentives for bipartisan cooperation decrease, especially on the part of the minority party who by blocking the majority party can eventually, they hope, uh, expose the majority party as being unproductive and regain control of Congress themselves. And, and we've been for the last 40 years in a period of partisan parity. And it does seem that in a sense, the institutional logic, and that's going to be the other focus of, of, of today's lecture, the way in which the institutions uh, of our 21st century democracy and civil society are also generating a particularly deep and destructive kind of partisan polarization. Now, to, to, to drill down on this topic, I'm going to focus on the work, as I, I mentioned last week, of a contemporary journalist, Ezra Klein. And I think many of you are already familiar with him from the work he does with the New York Times. He started with the Washington Post. He uh, eventually founded his own online journal. I shouldn't say his own, it was a collaborative project, but, but he had uh, the role of one of the chief and founding editors of Vox, which is an online informational journalism site. And uh, to, to be clear, the purpose, I believe, of Vox is to drill down beneath the surface of the news story of the day and try to provide some deeper context using statistics, data, social science to explain why the news that we're seeing is happening in the way that it's happening. I think it's a very valuable outlet. It, it remains so after Klein's departure. Uh, I turn to it regularly for news information insight. And, and then uh, you may be aware he has uh, the Ezra Klein show a few weeks ago. He interviewed Barack Obama a couple weeks ago. He had, I think, a very good round table on climate change. Um, this is now housed by the New York Times. And if you use the New York Times online. You can uh, watch the Ezra Klein show. Uh, if, if not, um, you can get transcripts or uh, typescript versions of, of, of many of the shows as well. But the, the real work I'm going to be focusing on with you is a book that was published last year called Why We're Polarized. And it is, I think, a, a really um, wonderful resource in terms of providing a synthesis of contemporary social science that is uh, very thorough, very well researched. It's not a specialized contribution. He doesn't do any original uh, studies himself, but uh, for a kind of one-stop introduction to the way in which social psychology, political science, sociology, economics understand the roots of 21st century American polarization, I don't think you could do better than the book Why We're Polarized. It's also very readable. He has a real talent for uh, capturing the complexity of ideas in relatively simple, relatively concise prose. And, and so if you were looking for something to read, uh, I would suggest Klein's Why We're Polarized. Now, 
I, I'm just going to very briefly review some of the evidence that were polarized. And so uh, you, you've seen this diagram from me many times before. And, and this is a diagram of polarization in the Congress, right? Starting in the 1940s, going up into the 2010s. And what the diagram shows very clearly is that in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, when it came to legislation, and right, each, each little splotch represents a Congress, right? That's a two year period, a, a session of Congress. And um, during that period, how did Republicans vote and how did Democrats vote on specific pieces of legislation? And you can see Democrats voted much more often for Democratic sponsored legislation. Republicans voted much more often for Republican voted sponsored legislation in the 1940s. I mean, that, that, that's natural. If it weren't uh, the case that the party was supporting its own legislation, it wouldn't really be a modern political party. But what you can also see is, is if you squint or look closely, that there's an awful lot of overlap, it looks kind of gray purple, and there are an awful lot of red dots in the blue section of the, of the uh, diagram, and some blue dots in the red section of the diagram. And that means that there were Republicans voting for Democratic-sponsored legislation, vice versa, and some legislation in the middle that was co-sponsored by members of both parties and sustained votes from members of both parties. And if you now go down to the opposite corner, what you see is that by the time you get to the 2000s, this is completely broken down, right? The, the, the uh, parties are completely separated, completely uh, non overlapping in their legislative agenda. There are a few times that Democrats are voting for some Republican-sponsored legislation. There are a few times that some Republicans are voting for Democratic-sponsored legislation, but essentially the parties have become separate and non-cooperating entities. And the result is that the legislative productivity of Congress has consistently declined, right? And the numbers on the horizontal axis here represent the Congress, right? The 80th, the 82nd, the 84th, up to the 2012th. And, and so that represents roughly the last 50 years in Congress. And what you can see is that uh, for much of the period in the 60s and 70s into the 80s, Congress was reasonably productive, sometimes getting over a thousand bills passed, typically getting maybe around 700, 750 bills passed. And that uh, beginning with this period of partisan parity in the 1980s, the rate of productivity of Congress steadily declined, uh, down below 500 bills per session, minor uptick in 2008 with Barack Obama and the um, uh, super majority that the Democrats had in the Senate for a, a little while, and then declining ever since to the point where we're down to roughly a third of the legislative part productivity coming out of Congress in the current decade relative to those high water marks of the 1960s, 1970s, right? And, and so we have a system of checks and balances with multiple veto points, lots of ways to block and stop legislation if you want to. And the result is if you have partisan polarization, just less legislation is going to be passed. And whether we're talking about regulating banks or regulating hedge funds or regulating the mortgage industry and the housing market, whether we're talking about regulating the emerging sphere of social media and the way in which it works with children's brain chemistry and psychology, there's lots of stuff, right? And I didn't even touch the global climate crisis or the consequent need for 
greater infrastructure to cope with mega fires and mega storms. So many areas where we could use genuine legislative productivity and we're just not seeing it because of partisan polarization. Uh, this polarization is not symmetrical, ideologically speaking. The Republicans since the late 1960s have become consistently more conservative. Uh, we've talked together about the history of the Republican Party and the fact that since really the 1870s, they have been a party of big business with a, a big business constituency having a very strong influence over the candidates and the legislative platform that this party promotes. Having said that, it got a little bit more moderate in the post-war period and then has become considerably more conservative over the last 40 years. And what we see with the Democrats, and, and the, the diagram here is a little bit more complicated with regards to the Democrats because it separates Northern Democrats, Southern Democrats, and Democrats as a whole. And as you can see, the Southern Democrats were for most of the 20th century more conservative than the Democratic Party as a whole, and in a sense moved the Democratic Party uh, a little bit more to the center because of their presence within the party as the Southern Democrats left the Democratic Party in the 1970s and 1980s, their influence on the Democratic Party diminished. But at the same time, the Northern Democrats became a little bit more conservative, a little bit less liberal. And the result is that the Democratic Party has stayed quite stationary in terms of its ideology over most of the 20th century. Now, whether that's changing right now, I think it's a little too early to tell. Um, I think there's uh, real cross signals within the Democratic Party. I think that there's significant support in certain urban areas for a much more liberal, much more progressive agenda, but that the Democratic Party is not exclusively a party of the urban left. And even in places like New York City or uh, Baltimore, we're seeing uh, some pushback against uh, some of the agenda of the Democratic left within the Democratic Party. So it, it's not clear to me whether at some point the Democratic Party will continue moving to the left and that will further open the divide between the parties, but clearly the parties are quite divided. I've shown you this diagram before, but just to refresh your memory briefly, what we focused on so far is the parties. We need to focus on the average voter as well on, on ordinary citizens. And again, I, I believe that the right order to tell this story is that the parties and other major social institutions, especially the media, polarized first. The parties did it, and, and let's just spell this out for a second, in terms of Francis Lee's work, right? The, the, the person who gives us that diagram that shows Republican dominance from the 1870s through the 1920s, Democratic dominance from the 1930s through the 1970s, and then parity. One of the things that her work makes clear is that when we're in conditions of partisan parity, when either party could win the next election. And that gives the minority party an incentive not to cooperate with the majority party to try to torpedo its legislative agenda rather than trying to work with it and, and, and produce compromise on some issues. Um, that the party that is the obstructionist party, right, the current minority party. And, and you know, I, I think we can be clear that this is probably more characteristic of the Republican Party than the Democratic Party, but the Democratic Party clearly did not cooperate very much with Trump and the Republican Party when Trump was in the presidency and the Republicans were in charge of the Senate, right? So it goes both ways. Um, the issue is, 
that when you are not cooperating, when you are blocking or obstructing the current majority's legislative agenda, you have to explain to your voters why you're doing that. And, and the need to offer a justification tends to increase partisan considerations, right? You, you, you say that the other side is too liberal, that your side represents small government, anti-regulation, free enterprise, et cetera, right? And so you start putting down ideological markers. We're opposing them because this is the ideology they represent, and it's fundamentally different from our ideology. And if, and, and <clears throat> we're going to get into this in, in, in a few minutes, if the media is also increasingly separating out and characterizing its support for one side or the other in ideological terms, voters will learn and eventually internalize the kind of partisan polarization that elites are displaying. I, I believe that that is the right story about what happened in America over the last 40 years, that this is elite driven, but increasingly popular or uh, everyday citizen polarization. And you see this, for instance, in the study by the, the Pew Research Foundation, which shows that in 1994, when you look at survey data, the average Democrat and the average Republican are both quite moderate, right? That they're not as uh, sharply ideological as their parties are, and not very far apart. And the result is that if, if you unpack this on a whole range of issues, there's a lot of overlap on what Democrats believe and what Republicans believe. And then in the intervening 20 years, going forward to 2014, the average Democrat moves somewhat to the left, the average Republican moves considerably to the right, and so there's much more ideological difference between the median voters in these parties and much less overlap on ideological or policy positions. And so polarization is now not just an elite, but also a popular phenomenon. Um, uh, again, very quickly, what you see here is that the number of independents has, has uh, moved down considerably. And uh, there's a lot of literature on the idea that people who call themselves independents are actually just closet partisans. They're not willing to say they're a Republican or a Democrat, but they consistently vote in one direction or the other. The number of strong partisans, people who say I'm absolutely with my one party all the time, has gone up substantially. It's now 35% of the American electorate. And that the people who say the reason I'm a Republican is because I'm a conservative, or the reason I'm a Democrat is because I'm a liberal or a progressive, has also gone up substantially from the 1970s into the current century, right? And, and, and so, again, further evidence of the kind of polarization we're experiencing. Final thing to note is, is that much of this polarization is so-called negative polarization. And, and, and you get this by um, figuring out the difference between the feeling you have for your own party and the feeling you have for the other party. How positive is your feeling for your own party? How negative is your feeling for the other party? And as you can see in the 1960s, actually Democrats, this is in the period of democratic dominance, so they, they weren't very threatened by the other party, were actually pretty much indifferent. Yes, they voted for Democrats, but they didn't consider that to be a reflection on the inadequacies or dangerousness of the Republican Party. It's just they preferred their own party, right? Uh, already in the 1960s, uh, the Republicans 
were all feeling quite negative about the Democratic Party. But since the 1960s, this has gone up and gone up dramatically and gone up for both parties symmetrically. So at this point, uh, actually, the primary political motivation of most partisans is not enthusiasm for or support of their own party. It's either fear or anger directed at the candidates and the policy of the other party. We've got to keep the Democrats out or they will be coming after your guns, your Second Amendment rights. They'll put secular socialism in all the schools. We've got to keep the Republicans out or they'll keep stacking the courts with conservative justices and abortion rights will be a thing of the past. They will undo all environmental regulations and we'll be on our way to out of control climate change, right? And, and, and I hope you recognize that. I don't think that's a caricature. I think that's actually the primary focus of um, the contemporary political discourse. And I think part of the secret of Joe Biden's success politically is the way in which he has, in a sense, um, stopped being out front with his own legislative agenda, which makes it a little bit more difficult for the Republicans to attack him, right? He's about the policy without it being about him, the man, the individual, right? And, and, and that um, is probably uh, actually quite effective reaction to a period in which negative partisanship predominates. So um, final thing I, I, I want to point out, uh, and I, I've mentioned to you that in the 1950s, the American Political Science Association wrote a report on partisanship in the United States in which they said, it's actually not clear enough what the divides are between the parties. We're not sufficiently polarized or distinct. We're not giving the voters clear ideological choices. We wish we were more like Europe. Well, uh, be careful what you wish for, right? The, the, the issue is that a degree of partisanship is healthy for democracy because it does provide the voters with good, clear choices. But it matters both what kind of partisanship, is it positive? or negative, and how much partisanship. And, and uh, we can talk about the decline of civic trust, trust in critical institutions like elections, uh, which at this point appears to be quite reciprocal. Republicans obviously mistrusting the election of 2020 and its results, but Democrats also uh, mistrusting the way in which the American electoral system works and the way in which it amplifies minority power. And in addition to all of that, all these reasons to be concerned about too much polarization, I think this diagram from Diana Mutz and, and her book, Hearing the Other Side, is extremely important to see. And, and she uh, contrasts two different kinds of citizen that she brings into her lab and asks to engage in political conversation. Those with a civil orientation to political conflict, they believe that this is the way democracy works. It's appropriate that we should disagree. The other person, the other side has a right to their views. There's reasonable controversy. I should do my best to listen to and even try to compromise with them, given that controversy is legitimate. And those without a civil orientation, right? And, and those are the, the voters or citizens who say, no, the other side believes what it believes because they are un-American or because they are in the grips of some conspiracy theory that is absolutely false, 
or because they are fundamentally host hostile to people like me. And by the way, people like me are, are the true backbone of American society, right? And, 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 and so what this diagram shows very quickly is that the people who lack a civil orientation, when they engage in political uh, conversation with people who don't already agree with them, don't learn very much from that conversation. As a matter of fact, there are studies be besides Diana Mutt's study that show that people actually leave these conversations feeling more convinced that they're right and the other side is wrong. So if, if they're learning anything, it's that the other side is just a bunch of idiots who don't have any good arguments, right? And whereas the people with a civil orientation to conflict tend to learn a fair bit as the conversation progresses, right? They, they are able, after the conversation, to make many of the arguments of the other side in a persuasive way, even if they don't believe them. At least they understand them. They've taken them on board and learned from their interaction. And if we have increasing negative partisan polarization in the United States today, that means our civil orientation to conflict is declining. And so we're less able to hear each other, to learn from each other, to compromise with each other, and that is damaging democracy. All right, so that, that's a, a, a bit of the background to Ezra Klein's work. I'm gonna start where he starts, and, and, and this is a diagram I showed you at the end of the lecture last week on racial sorting and polarization in contemporary American politics. And I find this to be just stunning and so important, right? And, and so um, this is uh, an indication of the composition of the voters, how many of the voters for each party are non-white. And as you can see with the Republican party, it started very low and it has gone up consistently uh, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, dropped back down, actually, uh, with uh, the second election of George W. Bush and then the presidency of Barack Obama, uh, Bush's perceived uh, uh, anti-Islamic politics, I think, had something to do with this. And then obviously the fact that the Democrats fielded an African-American candidate in 2008 had something to do with this. Uh, the reason that minority support has gone up for the Republicans is, I think, basically that minorities have increased dramatically as yeah. a percentage of the overall electorate. Right. Um, and, and so, it, it, you know, if the Republican Party were not winning Latino votes in Florida, they would not be winning Florida and they would be a much less viable uh, national party. They've got to appeal to some non-white voters to be at all in the running in national political campaigns. Having said that, you can obviously see the market difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Democrats have gone from having five, seven percent non-white support to having over 40 percent non-white support. And, and, and that number, unless something very unexpected happens, going to just keep going up, right? And so in essence, one of the aspects, perhaps the most distressing aspect of the cleavage in contemporary American politics, the, the, the sharp partisan divide, is one party has become a multiracial party. And yes. we see this in its membership. We see this in the legislation it supports, in the way in which it appeals to voters. And the other party is essentially still a mostly white party. And again, if you just look at a picture of the Republicans in Congress and you contrast it with a picture of the Democrats in Congress, it's obvious on the face of those politicians that the Republican Party mirrors 
the racial composition of its electorate. They are a mainly white party. Now, uh, having said all of this again to review and note that my source here is, is Vox, right? Um, that um, the, the, the share of the American population that is foreign born has gone up dramatically since immigration reform in the middle of the 1960s. It, 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 there's a bit of a lagging effect, but we're already up to around 15% foreign born, and we're gonna keep going up absent some uh, dramatic change in immigration policy. And so again, the Republicans have to appeal to more diverse voters, but the electorate as a whole is becoming much more diverse as a result of immigration patterns. And the right result of this ultimately is that we are going to become a society in which white people, people who self-identify on census forms as white, um, are going to still be the largest group in America, right? But are going to no longer be the majority, let alone the preponderant proportion of the population, right? Over 80% in 1965, under 50% uh, 100 years later, right? And, and so a dramatic reworking of the racial demographics of America. Um, African-Americans are not growing. They're, they're merely staying stable as a portion of the population. Latinos or Hispanics are obviously growing. Asians are growing even more quickly as a proportion of the population to the point that they will at some point over the next couple decades overtake African Americans as Hispanics already have. And, and, and you know, there is important political differences between Latinos and Asians, and there are important demographic differences, cultural differences, national origin differences, and ideological differences within each of these categories. But when you consider it from the perspective of white Americans, um, the dominant impression you get is that this country is rapidly losing its white majority, becoming a genuinely multiracial society for some of us, that's uh, invigorating, encouraging, perhaps challenging in certain ways, but also welcome as a development. For others of us, it is frightening. It, it is calling into question whether or not the character, the identity, the order of our society is going to continue or instead be swamped by these rapid demographic changes. Um, again, just reviewing the result of the shift in the partisan composition and the policy positions of the two parties is that the members, and in particular now looking at the white members of the two parties are diverging radically on their attitudes on race and immigration. What we see here is that uh, in 2012, if, if, if we look at um, white Democrats first, uh, the about 20% have a mostly positive view of African Americans, and I, I won't get into the details. Some of this is just, how do you feel about African Americans? If, if you had to put on a temperature scale how warm or cold you are to them, where, where would you put that? Some of it is about policy. Do, do you support uh, affirmative action or other policies to increase opportunity for African Americans? And, and you get a composite scale of how much uh, positive or negative attitude you have, how much resentment you have or don't have. And what we can see is that roughly 20% of Democrats uh, had a positive view of African Americans, but actually almost 30% had a, a negative view or a racial resentment view at the uh, middle of the Barack Obama presidency. 
by the time you get to 2016, right, you know, Trump is no doubt influencing these numbers. Democrats are uh, negative in their partisanship. They're anti-Republican. They're therefore anti-Trump in 2016. But uh, 40% of Democrats report having a positive view to African Americans and policies that support racial equality and justice, and only 18% have uh, a negative view. And so you can see it's more than uh, a complete reversal, right? It, there's been a real liberalization of white democratic attitudes to race uh, in recent history. And what you can see with Republicans is that it's basically always, I shouldn't say always, but over this time period, it's very stable, right? And very few Republicans have a positive or a non-resentful view of African Americans and policies that support racial justice. And the majority or the strong plurality have a negative or resentful view. We're gonna get into the implications of this further in just a minute, but let's look at immigration first. And again, you can see that from, and, and there's a slightly longer uh, time frame for this analysis, for white liberals, the idea that immigration is a critical threat to the United States has gone from being a majority in the middle 1990s to being a small minority in the 2016 uh, polling. And on the other hand, the number of people who think it's not important at all, right? It's not a threat, not a critical issue, has gone from 8% to fully a third of white liberals. When we look at white conservatives, what we can see is that in the 1990s, a strong majority thought it was a critical threat, and we're still there in 2016. The efforts of, of, for instance, George W. Bush to, to try to bring about immigration reform, but also to try to make the Republican Party more hospitable to Latinos, in part by moderating the view on immigration, has been reversed. And the result is, right, that there are very few um, Republicans who think it's not an important issue and a vast majority who think immigration is a critical threat to the identity or well-being of the United States. So let me now, and, and I know I've shared uh, these quotes with you before in a, a slightly different context, share with you Ezra Klein's view on why the racial dimension to contemporary partisan polarization is so important. Uh, and, and he puts it on, on this way on page 106 of, of why we're so polarized. And, and I think I did that wrong. It's why we're polarized. Uh, there is nothing that makes us identify with our group so strongly as the feeling that the power we took for granted may soon be lost or the injustices we've long borne may soon be rectified. Right, and, and we're getting both of those things simultaneously. And Black Lives Matter exemplifies both aspects of this, right? And, and so if one party is a primarily white party and white people feel threatened by Black Lives Matter, by abolish the police, by calls for reparations, by having a biracial woman as the vice president of the United States, having the congressional leadership be as diverse as, as it is, people of color feel empowered, emboldened, right? And so we're going in opposite directions that's enhancing our polarization. And then there's this quote from James Baldwin, which I, I, I absolutely love, uh, not only for its implications for polarization and the current moment, but for, I think, its deep insight into the nature of identity and what makes for a healthy racial identity. This is from his uh, collection of film criticism essays called The Devil Finds Work. An identity is questioned only when it is menaced, as when the mighty begin to fall, or when the wretched begin to rise, or when the stranger enters the gates, never thereafter to be a stranger, the stranger's presence making you the stranger 
less to the stranger than to yourself, right? And, and just to dwell on that for a moment, I think part of what he's saying, and, and, and you may have seen that Ta-Nehisi Coates essay in The Atlantic, the first white president, right, which was about Donald Trump, and the argument being that Donald Trump was the first white president who ran as a white racial candidate, right, who made white identity politics critical to his campaign, that, if that interpretation is correct, demonstrates that whites are being made to feel more self-conscious about their racial identity as their racial identity loses it's taken for granted normative standing. This isn't just a white society anymore in which the default identity position is being white, right? And, and, and so making you the stranger to yourself, you're not quite who you thought you were as your society becomes more diverse. Identity would seem to be the garment with which one covers the nakedness of the self, in which case it is best that the garment be loose, a little like the robes of the desert, through which robes one's nakedness can always be felt and sometimes discerned. This trust in one's nakedness is all that gives one the power to change clothes. And so if I've got it right, what Baldwin is saying here is, look, racial identity categories are big, broad-based, ascribed identities. I look at you and I put you into one of these bins right away, right? You know, you're white, you're black, you're Asian, you're Latino. I just see you and I categorize you. And that's fine if that doesn't exhaust who you are, right? If, if, if you are able to say, okay, that's the way society sees me, that's one aspect of who I am, but I'm this and that and this also. I have a religious and a professional and an artistic and a sexual identity, and none, none of those exhausts me or completely confines me. But in those moments when racial identity is challenged, it grows in salience and perhaps it tends to eclipse other identities. And, and I'll just point out to you, we, we've, we've talked about these issues in the context of other lectures before. And, and the, the, there's lots of, of, of research that shows that when you make people more aware of their racial identity, it tends to have a stronger influence on their behavior including their political behavior. Jennifer Richeson, a Yale University MacArthur fellow uh, in psychology, does these studies in, in California, she was at Stanford for a while, in which she um, takes subjects and, and gives them a, a, a test of their political views on race and immigration issues. One group she just gives the test to, another group she asks to read an article before they uh, start the test. And the article is about the fact that California has become a majority minority state and that this is going to continue and will eventually be the case for the United States as a whole. And what she finds is that the people who read the article become much more conservative in the way that they answer questions. They have been primed. They've been led to think about the fact, and by the way, I should have said at the outset, this is all white people, right? They've become aware, they've been made aware of the fact that they are becoming a minority in their own state, in their own society, and this pushes them in a more conservative direction. Uh, Ryan Enos, whose, whose work I've spoken with you uh, about before, a political scientist at Harvard University, the one who did that wonderful study in the Boston uh, commuter rail system went to white liberal suburban Boston and deliberately put a few Latinos on the train speaking Spanish loudly and, and was able to show doing surveys before he put the Latinos on the train 
after he put the Latinos on the train, that these white liberal Bostonians became much more conservative on their views and <laughs> much more likely to support Trump because the test, the, the study was done in 2016 just because they were exposed to people speaking Spanish on the train. That's a different way of, of, of priming the racial issue, right? Um, the uh, other, I think, you know, aspect of this, which I've mentioned already, Ashley Jardina has a, has a nice book on this called White Identity Politics, that um, for the first time in American history, we have a major political party trying to organize and mobilize white people as white people, trying to suggest that you've got to protect your rights as white people. And I should correct myself. I shouldn't say for the first time in American history. Obviously, we've talked about the Dixiecrats in the South. But this is, I think, the, the, the first time this is happening on a national basis, that one of our major parties sees itself as protecting the interests of white people as such, or is at least using coded and increasingly explicit language to try to get white voters to think of themselves potentially as an embattled and aggrieved minority. So uh, one of the, the, the things to, to notice here is that um, this has a, a, a profound influence on people's sense of their belonging and their prospects in, in our society. Uh, I don't have the diagram ready to hand. I don't think, no, I don't. Uh, I, I may be able to get there later in the lecture, probably not given the timing, but that, that actually um, white people in general, and especially white Republicans, understanding of their economic prospects increased dramatically under Donald Trump. Similarly, many African Americans, but also Latino and Asians, feelings about their economic prospects warmed considerably under Barack Obama. It's, it's too early to tell what's gonna happen with, with Biden. And the metaphor I like for this is it's almost like holding a lottery ticket. And, and what we recognize about people who buy lottery tickets, it, it is economically irrational to buy a lottery ticket. You, you would be better served just putting that money in your bank account than buying the lottery ticket given the prospects of winning. But psychologically, there's a certain logic to it. If you buy the ticket for uh, a week in advance of the draw, right? For that week, there's at least a possibility that next week you're gonna be a multimillionaire. Right, and that kind of buoys you, kind of, kind of makes you feel good about your economic prospects, even if it's not rational to believe you're gonna win. Similarly, when you've got a politician who plays the card of white identity politics, it shows in, in research data that white Americans start feeling better about their economic prospects. It's, it's uh, a deep psychological um, influence on our mood, whether or not uh, uh, the, the, the party that seems to favor our racial identity group, our conception of America is in office, is in power. And, and so then this um, means that it's increasingly the case that identity politics is, is, is visible within our political system. And uh, Jennifer Richardson, who, who I find to be very insightful on these issues, talks about the fact that white people are increasingly have to, having to confront the fact that um, their power is in jeopardy, that their interests have been secured in part through at least an implicit agenda of racial hierarchy. And we could talk about all of the ways in which the New Deal was racially targeted. That white people are 
beginning to feel racial discomfort, beginning to feel, and, and I think this is obvious in the uh, attacks on critical race theory that have become so popular in conservative politics in America this year, beginning to feel some sense that um, maybe we have not got everything we've got on the up and up via legitimate means. Maybe despite the fact that we remain quite ignorant about it, <coughs> we were the beneficiaries. We in the West and the North and the East, places that were not Jim Crow states, of the way in which the Southern Democratic Party engineered the New Deal to benefit white people. And, and so Richeson refers to this as the democratization of racial discomfort. African Americans, Latinos, Asians have often been made to feel uh, that they are of questionable belonging in the United States or that they don't get what they got through merit, et cetera that this is beginning to affect white Americans and that given the racial segregation of our political parties these days, this is further amplifying the degree of racial polarization as a dimension of partisan polarization. Let me conclude just for the next couple minutes showing you some research I've shown you before from Larry Bartels, uh, one of the most important contemporary American political scientists who did this survey uh, at the beginning of 2020, published in July of 2020, um, of uh, white Republican leaning or Republican voters attitudes on a number of issues. And, and, and these are issues to do with whether or not it might be necessary to use force to save the American way of life. And, and what you can see is that 50% of these white Republican voters uh, agreed with that statement and less than 10% disagreed. That uh, there may come a time when patriotic Americans will have to take the law into their own hands 40% agree with that statement or strongly agree with that statement. Fewer than 10% disagree. Strong leaders have to bend the rules sometimes. Again, we're close to 50% agreeing, close to 5% disagreeing. It's hard to trust elections when so many people will vote for anyone who offers a hand. Oh. Right. And, and again, you're getting the language of racial resentment built into these uh, survey questions. Right. Seventy five percent of Republican leaning voters in the survey strongly agree or agree with that statement. Less than three percent disagree. Right. Now, Bartels, in analyzing this, tries to look at education, tries to look at level of political interest, tries to look at political geography, and finds that none of that explains these answers to these questions. There's no strong correlation with those variables and, and the uh, responses on the questions I've just shown you. But there's a very strong correlation with what's called ethnic or racial antagonism, right? Which is what we were looking at together a few minutes ago. As you move up the scale, as you say, I feel less warm about African Americans, I'm more opposed to affirmative action, the likelihood that you're gonna uh, support force, take the law into your own hands, uh, mistrust elections goes way up. And, and so when we look at what happened on January 6th of this year, the storming of the Capitol by a mob of Trump supporters trying to disrupt the registering of the Electoral College outcomes. And we look at the racial demographics of the Republican Party, and we look, drill down on how white people are experiencing their diminished majority status in the society, I believe we get at some fundamental insight into contemporary American politics. And I think Ezra Klein helps us to understand how deep the social psychological roots of identity threat can be, how deep the tendency to think in terms of 
in-group and out-group will be in those circumstances. And, and that's where I'll pick up when we get together next week. I'll stop and, and I'm happy to take whatever questions you've got. Who wants to start us out? And I think, let me make sure, I'm gonna unmute everyone so you know. Mar Marion, um, let me unmute everyone. Uh, go ahead. Marion, I think you're gonna have to hold down your space bar too. Okay. There can, you go, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. It seems to me that among the whites uh, that you're talking about, there's a huge economic difference. Uh, the, uh, the liberals that I know, and that tend to be fairly successful economically, do not seem to be part of the group that you talked about that is worried about losing its, um, uh, you know, its, its level of um, authority. They're, they're still more guilty about having taken it away, or at least uh, some generations back, having taken it away from blacks. Whereas um, the poor whites um, are more likely to be worried about competition from uh, the other races. So I think there's a huge gap, a uh, difference in, within the party. Marion, let, let me ask you, um, the, uh, and, and, and I definitely agree that this is not a generalization about all white people. Right. And, and please note that the majority of Democratic voters are still white. Right. So, so, so um, clearly the Democratic Party has succeeded in creating a multiracial coalition in which they get the vast majority of African-American and Asian support, a large preponderance of Latino support and significant white support as well. Um, so the, the, there are a lot of white people who are perfectly comfortable with supporting a party that has become a multiracial coalition in the transformation of American society. My question for you is, so the white people you're referring to, let me ask two other issues about them. You're, you're saying they're wealthy and, and that's what you're, you're putting this down to, or they're economically secure, let's, let's put it that way. Are they... Well, where do they live? What's the question? Where do they? That's, that's the first question, yeah. Where do they live? Yeah. Well, I think mostly in California and in New York. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's one thing. Secondly, what level of education do they have? Hi. Yeah, so, so you, you, now let me fully respond to your question, which is to say, there are some quite wealthy white people who remain quite hostile to the racial transformation of American society. But many of them live in dominantly white areas. And, and again, Ryan Enos's work, uh, The Space Between Us, is, is very interesting in showing. What, he didn't put those Latinos on uh, a BART train because nobody would notice them, right? Because it's already racially diverse. He put them in a lily white Boston suburb where they don't have Latinos. And, and, and so white people tend to be <coughs> more threatened by diversity when they live in a dominantly white area and it starts to diversify, right? And, and so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that um, if you get an uh, education, in the United States over the last 40 years, the Republicans do have a point, which is to say, if you go to college or university, you have probably been introduced to people, even if they're not calling it critical race theory, who will give you some historical information that will make you more critical of the role of white people in our society, right? And, and, and a little bit more likely to support affirmative action, reparations, immigration reform, et cetera, right? And, and, and so it's not, I think, wealth per se. There's a lot of overlap between having a good education and getting wealthy. There's a lot of overlap between living in the California or New York or a coastal city and wealth. But frankly, I think what may be doing more of the work here is geography and education than socioeconomic standing by itself. Mm-hmm.
But th thank you for the point, Marion, and thank you for getting us a little bit. This isn't all white people, and, and obviously, you know, our group is dominantly white. Uh, I don't sense that our group is, is you know, running out to attend the Trump rallies for the most part. Um, Don, did you have a, a question or, or not? I couldn't tell if you were raising your hand. Uh, okay. I'm raising my hand. And I can't tell, Don, are you deliberately sharing your screen? No. Okay, so, so uh, Flossie, go ahead, and I'm going to try to see if I can't uh, fix this. Go back. Flossie, go ahead. It seems to me that the idea that the Republican Party was a party of gentlemen essentially well-bred and, um, and having some sense of, some conscience, I'm thinking of the way McCarthy was dismissed, not because he was a lawyer, but partially because he was no gentleman. And finally, Eisenhower and his friends decided that he had to go. He was white trash. That doesn't exist anymore. A good party of the Republicans that we saw storming the White House would once be called white trash. And or, I think that may be a, the undoing of the Republican Party. Or a mob, right? And 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 so they were, they were but they were a big mob. Yeah. And mm. and so uh you know I, I, we'll have to see. Um and, and when I say we'll have to see, uh, unfortunately, it may take 10 or 20 years to figure and this out, right? And a lot of people right? may die. Was Donald Trump the last gasp of this kind of politics, or was he the beginning of a movement far to the right and uh, of the legitimation of what I'll call racial grievance in the Republican Party, right? And and so um, I agree with you, Flossie, that there was a, in American politics in general, a, a kind of gentleman's agreement in the 1950s and 1960s, and, and really for many, many years before that as well. It was broken at points, but but at long periods it, it held that, that while we may, be partisan rivals, we are nevertheless going to be decent and respectful in the way that we treat each other. And there's certain things that are out of bounds that, that, that you just don't do. And, and that part of the problems with the politics of racial resentment is that it doesn't seem to know those bounds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you nominate a person who seems to have spent his whole life aggrieved, uh, resentful, angry at being disrespected because of the borough that he comes from, right? You, you, you end up legitimizing uh, the nastiness of contemporary politics. And please note that um, you sometimes uh, get people within the Democratic Party who want to fight fire with fire, right? Yes. And, 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 and so this is, I think, one of the things that, that's really important about Ezra Klein's work. He says, you know, look, let's not be caught navel gazing. Let's think about where this leads 10 or 20 years from now. And, and if we stay on these tracks, we're not headed in a good direction in terms of our politics. The level of polarization that we see is one thing, but another thing is the trend lines. We just keep getting further and further apart, more and more distrustful, more and more hostile. If we keep going down those lines, it's gonna be really hard to cooperate with any kind of respect uh, five, 10 years from now. Um, Joanne, go ahead. Uh, I think a lot of our opinions are just made because we don't know each other. We don't know each other as individuals. There's so much segregation 
that we don't know people except by their color. We don't know them as people. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. I'm, uh, there's a social psychological hypothesis, uh, and um, it's uh, coined in the, the kind of one of the foundational texts of uh, kind of racial psychology. Um, and uh, this is the um, idea of the contact hypothesis, right? Wow. Which is, is, is to say, and, and this was in Gregory Alport's <laughs> uh, famous study, <laughs> that if you bring people together, it makes it very hard for them to stereotype each other or to rely exclusively on their stereotypes. And Ryan Enos and a number of other contemporary social psychologists, I think have been very influential in showing that that's not quite right. The question is not only do you have contact, but the context in which the contact occurs how sustained it is and so to 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 put it in the in the simplest way possible those two latinos who enter the commuter train in suburban boston they're making contact with white people but they're not decreasing their stereotypes they're increasing their fear right oh no this is coming to my really white neighborhood there goes my property values right um it has to be the kind of contact that lets you get to know the other person and to see, oh wait, they're not quite <laughs> the devil that I thought they were, right? Good, good, Joanne. David, go ahead. I hear you decrying the uh, polarization, but what am I to do because I'm right? <laughs> so so we, we, will, we will talk about this. Uh, <laughs> next um session and and without disputing your infallibility david um <laughs> what the, the issue here i think is what's sometimes called identity protecting cognition and so right. why are you right are you right because you're on the right side or are you right because you've thought the issue through carefully, you've listened to the right experts, and you have made up your mind for yourself? And, um, you know, both of those are sources of what you might call cognitive confidence. You know, I, I know I'm right because I'm on the right side. Or alternatively, uh, I know I'm right because my process of making up my mind was careful and considered. But they're very different kinds of cognitive confidence. And I think part of the problem is that we're much more reliant on identity protecting cognition than we are on truth sensitive cognition in the current. Well, I've done, I've done my research, I listened to Fox. You know, uh... yeah, and and this is uh, compounding the problem, which is that our information ecosystem <laughs> is um, increasing our confidence that people like us must be right. Promise, yeah. I promise you, I'll get to the details of this <laughs> next week. Um, let's see, Don, you, you, or you've got your hand up. You'll have to unmute yourself, but go ahead. Okay. Same. Yep. Okay. The thing is, is that, you know, I, we have friends who are black, very close friends. We've backpacked with them. We've, yeah. we've camped with them. I mean, they're really, they're really close friends. And, um, and I also wonder about where the question, uh, white privilege, see, the, 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 the theologians are raising that. Yes. Yes. How do we deal with, how, how we would deal about with white privilege? How do we get the congregation to really deal with it? Uh, so, the complicated questions and territory, and I'm not going to be able to go into all of it in detail, but I'll, I'll just say um, the first step is getting people to acknowledge it, right? And, yeah. and so, the, you know, and, and, and by the way, interracial contact, interracial friendship 
the yeah. capacity to be able to see the issue from the other side, in part because you have some fondness for someone from the other side, right? We've seen a remarkable transformation in attitudes to sexuality and homosexuality in particular in the United States over the last quarter century. And a large part of that has to do with the fact that so many of us have gay friends and relatives, right? And, and as it's become more and more acceptable to be openly gay, we recognize, wait a sec, you know, this isn't just some abstract problem. That's my cousin, that's my nephew, my uncle, my brother, my sister, my best friend from high school that I'm talking about. I, I, that may lead me to moderate my views. So, so one thing to do would be to try to overcome the segregation. And you remember what Martin Luther King Jr. said, right? That, that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in American society, <laughs> right? So if, if you're dealing with it at a church, how do you either reconstitute your membership or maybe if that's too much, bring your church in contact with another parish that has more diverse members. Uh, getting people self-conscious about white privilege, it, it's hard. But, but I, I, I would suggest, you know, one, one of the simple thought experiments here is if George Floyd was white and Derek Chauvin was black, what do you think would have happened, right? If you are white and you're pulled over by the police, what is your attitude, right? Maybe I'm gonna get a ticket. I'm not happy about that, right? But, it, but you know, do I think that it's likely that I will end up being the subject of police violence? If I were black, what would I feel Absolutely. in this situation, oh, right? Exactly to, to, to force people to, to, to reckon with the distribution of fear and discomfort in our society is kind of an everyday aspect. And, and, and to just acknowledge that not having to fear the police, not having to fear being profiled by the store clerk and That's being followed around the store to see if you're shoplifting, not having to worry about the <coughs> way in which public policy is implemented and whether it will be implemented in ways that are hostile to your area, your group, you. That all of that is part of the fabric of our society. And it's really unfair, right? And, and so getting people to think about that, then getting them to think about history, right? You know, and by the way, this has been going on for a couple hundred years. This is not anything new and it shapes the whole social world that we live in. All right, so I'm gonna call it a day. We've already gone 20 minutes over. I could probably talk with you all day, but I do actually have to go about my other business as well. Everybody take care, be well. I will see you next week and in person uh, as soon as it's viable, probably next month. All right, take care, everyone. You take bye -bye. care. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, David. Bye, guys.